very sleepy, but after 10 or 15 minutes after a good lunch, you may start falling asleep. So from time to time, I'll just yell and, and wake you up. But it's always a pleasure to be back in Belgrade, and I thank you for coming to hear this. Uh, I will talk about, you see the topic, so I will not uh, repeat that. Uh, there is a problem always with karst, but all these bullets are applicable to any other porous media. And when we develop a conceptual model for a site, and site meaning it can be a, a little area of a chemical plant or a whole watershed, that's what we call a site. It's really the project area, in other words. There are a few things that we have to all figure out. Where is the groundwater coming from and where is it flowing to, obviously? And then if there are contaminants in that groundwater, it's the same. Where did they come from, meaning contaminants, and where are they flowing to? So it seems like a, a common sense, but in karst it's very complicated sometimes because those simple things are very uh, strange sometimes. And you see on, on your right that little uh, map showing some dye tracing tests and as we all know in karst sometimes the uh, trace, tracing uh, tests and actually show that there's a crossing between lines sometimes during the seasons groundwater will flow into a different watershed so it's not all that easy when we work in karst we all know that or people at least people that do work in karst uh, the main really complicating thing in all this is that drainage areas, topographic drainage areas, are often not the same as subsurface drainage areas or hydrogeologic drainage areas. These are just some examples why is that. During the evolution of cars, sometimes we, have, we can have a sinking stream developing and the groundwater will start flowing where we do not expect that. And then any number of convoluted things may be taking place, like here, so you can dump a dye in a, in a pono or a sink and it can flow somewhere else and then you know, it can be convergent or divergent or any number of those complicated things. So it is not that easy when we say uh, develop conceptual model in cars and then decide how you remediate if it's contaminated, if the groundwater is contaminated. So just a few more slides be before we start digging into uh, uh, meat of the topic is just a reminder for everyone that limestones in general have the widest range of porosities of any other rock that exists. Uh, and that's really due to custification, dissolution processes that will enlarge porosity in general. But some young limestones, semi-consolidated limestones, can have primary porosity more than 50%. So when you combine all that, you can see that the, the range of porosity is the widest. And uh, th this all data, all this data you see is based on, uh, it's, it's of course processed, but it's based on tens of thousands of samples from around the world that the United States Geological Survey collected and it's available for everyone and then you can do any statistics you want. But these are limestones from all over the world and it just so happens that the average uh, so uh, the average frost is 8%, but it doesn't mean anything really, it's just to show you that it can be really wide. And then that all these consequences out of that, because contaminants will have very different fate and transport in something that's less porous versus something that's more porous. So just bear that in mind. Now, before again, we go into a little more engineering aspects. One thing that any conceptual model, and, and if you work in hydrogeology or quantitative hydrogeology, you know that models can be used to help many things, including to help design remedial uh, action when you have to clean something. So models are now commonly used for many different things. Well, the problem in karst is that a lot of people and consultants and agencies are using inadequate tools to model cost, and I'll show that. So if you use equivalent porous media models or model, like uh, common mod flow is really based on Darcy's law, it's finite differences model, and it uses that intergranular approach to flow. Okay? And we all know that in cars it's pretty much impossible to do it, but people still do it. And so this shows a, a perfect example I'm sorry for that. 
I have to turn around, but uh, you will see that this says here, actually I don't see it, I guess I removed it. United States Geological Survey developed a model for Texas Aquifer, uh, Edwards Aquifer in Texas, which is the largest, the most prolific one in the United States. And so they use this equivalent porous media approach and they developed a model. And what the model shows for this particular area of interest is this. The groundwater, you see those brine lines, brown lines here? And we have some areas with sinking streams and so on, but anyway, the model doesn't take that into account because it's a Darcy's model, it's based on Darcy's flow, mud flow is. And so between the arrows, the travel time is one year. And that's what the model says. But the actual field data shows something completely different. After they did the modeling, and so on, the Edwards Aquifer Authority actually did some dye tracing tests and you can see what the data show. Something almost perpendicular to what their model shows because it has different concepts and so on and the water moves uh, uh, kilometers a day. I mean, so it's a, it's a very flawed concept and yet across the world and in the United States people keep using these uh, types of models to then re remediate groundwater based on that input. And so now there's really a breakthrough last several years where people now can, it's in public domain, anyone can do it. There are now modules developed within Modflow that can simulate conduits with real hydraulics and, and, and fade and transport of contaminants in those conduits. And they interact freely with the porous media around it, with the matrix. And so, but you can see how different it can be when you use something that's I inadequate you may have a very different answer if you actually use this Darcy's approach and I'll again say it's equivalent porous media approach. So the way they do it, they just, uh, where there is a conduit or someone believes there is a conduit because there is indication, they just assign very high hydraulic conductivity to those cells. And then the model takes care of the rest, but unfortunately the, the, some of the, some concepts that are developed here are really flawed. So there is a contaminant front which is shown with this red line and it just happens that there is this, this for a real, real site. There is a spring contaminated uh, with the tri trichloroethylene, so it's a solvent. It's a real problem. There is a plume. I didn't show the whole plume, but just a, a front of that contaminant. And so the, the uh, remediation in this case uh, consists of stopping the contaminant from getting to the spring. And so they were now modeling that and showing that, yes, maybe with three wells around the conduit, you can actually capture that contaminant before it shows up at the spring. Every, everyone's happy because the model says so and you know there are other things that went into it. And what happens with these fake conduits that are really not based on physical realities, uh, your particles, which are these lines, will enter that fake area where there is a conduit, they can flow along that flow path and then the, uh, the wells around it may be able to ca capture it. So the contaminants will come out of that because now we're pumping next to it. So everyone's happy. However, in reality, if you model that conduit with real equations that are not Darcyan but are based on hydraulics, very different things actually happens. When contaminants enter that conduit, they keep flowing to the spring and these, uh, the wells around it cannot capture it. So this is just showing you how these, with adequate tools, you can now develop concepts and test if remediation in this case using pump and treat, meaning you're pumping the contaminant out in the groundwater and then treating it, can be feasible, but obviously it's flawed. So I will now uh, in, uh, go between that new model that's developed for a particular purpose, which is to model karst and back and forth with concepts of remediation. What this new, and it's called unstructured grids, mod flow with unstructured grids because you can make grid of any size, it can be telescoped or nested grid, it's really fantastic. Uh, it has many features now available that we need for modeling. I have still some time, is that right? 
Okay, good. Uh, which is when we deal with these non-aqueous phase liquids, such as Dean apples, something that's denser than water or lighter than water, they don't mix with groundwater that easily, and especially the solution rate is a little bit lower than for, say, metals. Uh, it's very important with what kind of porosity you deal when you, when you try to characterize and then remediate, because some of those contaminants will be bonded to porous media, the grains, some of, some of them may be actually drainable, you can extract them via gravity, or you may have a separate phase. So you see all these fancy symbols, but that's what th these models like this one can actually model. They can model interactions with, between mobile phase, immobile phase for that contaminant, dissolution, sorption, many different things. And I will skip through this very quickly because no one really likes these equations, especially after lunch. But what this does show that a uh, module within USG can now model all the processes that contaminants are subject to. We call that fate of contaminants, sorption, degradation, dual phase transport between a free product like gasoline, for example, and groundwater. So you will have a product that's just a BTEX, you know, gasoline and groundwater, and there's a transfer how that actually dissolves. So all that is, but more importantly, the same thing can now be explained in conduits or preferential flow paths and the matrix around the conduit. So there is a full interaction between the rock itself and then fractures or conduits or what we call preferential flow paths. So it's very powerful. And now I'll show you an example how if you do that, you can actually model real uh, physics, which is sometimes these conduits can receive water, and maybe somewhere along the conduit, the water will be getting out of the conduit into the matrix because of the difference in the hydraulic head, for example, inside the conduit and around the conduit. This would not be possible to model with equivalent porous media models at all. It's just not possible. And so if we now look at the source of contamination and the plume, you know, like this little thing, it's called plume. This is just on a conceptual level. We're showing that if we actually now have a conduit, a plume development and fade and transport may be very different because that conduit will act as a drain. Uh, the, the contaminants will start flowing along the conduit and maybe they will exit the conduit further down gradient because now there is enough water and head in the conduit versus the surrounding matrix. So now actually the, con the uh, contaminant will be leaving the conduit and creating a plume. So we have something called detached plume. None of this would be possible to model with the regular model and that's why I'm showing it and it, and kind of emphasizing the tools that we now have to really assess feasibility of remediation, which is really what this is all about. So let's talk about real cost. If we have a spill of something at the land surface, say Dean Apple, dense non-aqueous phase liquid, and it was happening many decades ago or years ago, no one really knows how, but it was spilled. You know, we have waste disposal practices of all kinds especially at large military bases or chemical plants. Who can even find that contaminant now after decades of flowing through, and you can see all kinds of convoluted pathways. You have unconsolidated sediments between these uh, karst uh, features or different type of limestone, is that right? Some of that grayish stuff will have different porosity than the rest of it. So it really gets complicated. And we know in the United States that it's almost impossible at real cars place a uh, site with a lot of history of contamination to characterize and find all these contaminants. It's just not possible because you would have to drill thousands of observation boreholes and monitoring wells and maybe even after that you won't be able to really fully understand that. And so, again, I will not read all of that. I, th I think this will all be made available to all of you so you can at some point read it, uh, but at this particular site, after investing tens of millions of dollars, it was concluded 
We just can't really fully characterize that. It may not be practicable to even find every last drop of contaminant. And so what do we do then? Again, I don't expect you to read all this, it's very busy, but the way we approach problems then is we look at all available technologies. You see on the left, it's what kind of technology you can actually try to use, and then you assess feasibility of that. And of course, very important is the amount of money you would have to spend. And in the red, you see disadvantages of karst, or fractured rock, which is the main problem with all these technologies, and I'll go through some examples, is that there, there is high level of uncertainty if something will work. Because if we inject nutrients for bioremediation purposes, like we want to stimulate the bugs that are in the subsurface, make them happy so they can then better degrade the contaminant. The main problem in karst is that residence time, for example, and also where after we inject the nutrient or a fluid, where will it go? If it gets into conduit, it will be gone in, in uh, you know, hours or days, and we may need a much longer residence time. And so, the same with physical barriers. If we're, if we're trying to uh, stop the contaminant from moving or free phase, of that fluid from moving. The main problem, just like with dams, for example, when we try to prevent leakage under and around dams, we have to grout it, is that right? And it, there is no certainty in that, that you can easily, uh, and knowing with how much money you have, you can guarantee with 100% that you will stop the leakage. It's usually very difficult to do that. The same in this, in this case, when we talk about contaminants. And I will show you some and we'll wrap it up. Uh, something that's gaining uh, quickly popularity in the United States is uh, thermal remediation for these complicated sites where we have Dean apples sitting there in the subsurface for uh, years or even decades and slowly diffusing into the rock matrix. And so we now have, sorry about that, we have contamination sitting in the rock matrix not so much in conduits, because usually it will be flushed through the conduits. But say we have in dead-end pores or small fractures that are feeding conduits, we, we may have separate phase or very high concentration of a contaminant. What thermal heating does, it mobilizes that. And, and also because of the heat, it can destroy some of that and certainly vaporize. Uh, volatiles, for example, TC or PC. So it's considered as a very promising technology. It's very, very expensive because you're using a lot of energy to heat the subsurface. So how do we deal with that? You have to assess the feasibility of it. So if we assume some kind of uh, limestone here with the, whatever porosity we want to assume and hydraulic conductivity without any conduit, uh, this is a, a thermal heat trans uh, transfer uh, uh, model we're looking at, because heat will propagate similar to fluid. It's basically a similar model, you just use different parameters. Uh, it's in, this particular one is available in free, it's free domain, in public domain, for USGS, VS2DT. Uh, you can show that actually by introducing heat and heating with, the, I guess, what, four heater wells, it is feasible to heat it up to 80 degrees Celsius because that's a, a target temperature for TCE, for example. So everyone's happy and we can say, look, it's possible to do it. However, if, if you put a condor in the middle of it and then model that, you will see that it's infeasible because that condor would be bringing colder water all the time and sort of break the flux. And, and that would be like a monkey wrench because you will not be able to heat it. And so we have tools that actually can simulate hypotheticals, but also if you really know there's a conduit there of some kind, or a fracture zone. So you go back and forth with models and data, uh, and you need to know a few more parameters for your site. And we call that uncertainty analysis, probability analysis, however you want to call it, but that's a must when you do feasibility study for remediation in cars. So in this particular case, we're showing it's really not feasible. Another popular uh, 
technology for dealing with the chemicals is in situ chemical oxidation, which is the introduction of different kinds of chemicals that will destroy physically or chemically the contaminant. But even more popular, or at least by the front clients that we work for, because it's less costly, it doesn't have a lot of risk associated with develop all these unwanted reactions is bioengineering. So we're stimulating the bugs of the bacteria that lives in the subsurface. In this particular case, it's a real site where we're doing a hydrogen releasing a compound that releases hydrogen. And bugs really love it for in urban conditions to degrade TC, uh, trichloroethylene, which is, uh, and, and this shows the results, for example. And, and this is a pilot test. So you're looking at visibility, you're testing if this will work at your site. And this is a graph for one well, downgrading from where all this was injected. And uh, there were two injection episodes. Here. Here. And one, one problem in cars is you can have quickly changing conditions from aerobic to anaerobic, for example, because you have inflow water rich with oxygen after rainfall. You may have uh, uh, pathways that are less rich in oxygen, for example. So even at a small site, you may have multiple conditions in the subsurface. And maybe it would work in, in this corner of the room, but it may not work there, all right? So even when you do a pilot test, there is still high uncertainty that you can now extend that, extend it to your entire site. However, this shows one common problem, which is because of these changing conditions, anaerobic and aerobic, uh, uh, unwanted consequence of, of trying to degrade the contaminant is actually building of a daughter product, which is degradation product, uh, that was not there before. And it may be more toxic and more mobile than the parent product. So vinyl chloride is such an example, or cis. Both the Sisley C, they're both daughter products of conventional TC. So you see what's happening. You have a color here. This yellow that you didn't see before. So basically, we did something actually pretty stupid, which is you're trying to degrade TC. You may be successful for a few years, but you're building vinyl chloride because conditions for degradation of vinyl chloride are not favorable. So the point here is you, you really have to understand the flow pattern at your site. You have to understand the chemistry and how it changes in time. And then, of course, your contaminant as well. And so I'm showing you examples of common things that have happened in the United States, which is we have to do something because the client is responsible for, for contamination and in the United States all drinking or groundwater is potentially a drinking water source, so you have to deal with it, you have to remediate it. Um, and some take-home points uh, for remediation in cars, this is just a brief overview, I can certainly discuss with any of you, or you can email and I'll send some free stuff. Because all of this is available uh, at the different uh, sites of public agencies and so on, is that all feasibility studies are really of remediation cars are, unnecess are necessarily quantitative. You have to quantify the numbers and uncertainty and probability because someone will be making decisions of spending millions of dollars on based on risk and probability of success. And as I said, sometimes it almost never it's possible to say that it's not technically practicable, it's not feasible, so therefore we cannot remediate it. That's the last thing agencies want to hear. And so you will have to go a long way with, the, with this probability analysis and sensitivity to show, well, if we do this, then this is the outcome. If there is a conduit, and sometimes we don't know if there is a conduit there or not, but we do that sensitivity. And when I say conduit, actually it's usually a network of conduits, is that right? Uh, so the remedial costs are important, but not so much for agencies that are in charge of making them do it. And so that, that's also taken into account. And then long-term operations and maintenance of your system. 
because sometimes when you put that system in, you have to stay there for 30 years. And so all these costs of operation and maintenance should be taken into account. And uh, basically the last section here shows that using equivalent porous medium approach, meaning you're treating your car's area as Darcy's intergranular porous medium is false. Just don't do that. And I've shown that and however people are still doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop with that. Any question?